My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. So the problem with wearable technology is it tells me that my heart rate's 125 beats per minute, which is a sign of nerves, I suppose. I want to tell you a story. Dom is an engineer, 23 years old, called me one day. This is what happens when you write a book, uh, is you get random strangers uh, who you don't even know calling you saying, I need some help. Don's job was to go to the oil uh, gas fields. And he would, he would take with him these big engineering diagrams, you know the ones with really big rolls of paper. And his job was to write in red ink on the, red, on the paper you know, what assets were there and get the serial numbers correct and so forth. And uh, Don thought, you know what, there's got to be a better way to do this. 22-year-old millennial, classic millennial. Got to be a better way to do this. So Don tried something different. He went and he got a little iPad, this little, little device, that went to iTunes uh, store, downloaded an app to do home inventory, copied the company corporate asset catalog, put it into the app, and then he went to the gas fields with a couple of his junior engineering buddies, and they would go from asset to asset, and they would, using the iPad, they would drop down box to go, oh, that's a, this kind of pump, and there's, there's a flare stack here, and this one's got a, this one's got a water separation unit. This one's got some issues. And they drive to the next asset. And then they would start, do it again. They would take photographs all the way. GPS data. In other words, they built a perfect, electronic, highly compliant, ready to be deployed register of the assets that were installed at the field. Not bad for a 23-year-old. Why did Don call me? He got called back to home office for some discipline. And he was told, go back to paper, please. We were expecting big engineering sheets of paper with red ink on them. I got a bunch of people back at the home office, senior engineers, checkers, supervisors. Their job is to take your handwritten notes and try and interpret them and type out into the computer systems what it is that you wrote on the paper. So Don's question to me was pretty simple. He said, how do I get my management to change? We're about to go through a wave of change driven by digital innovation. Don experienced what I call a technical success, but a workplace failure. Let me just share with you where some of this digital innovation that's coming is going to take us. First big change is supply growth. If the United States tight oil sa tight shales and tight sands plays uh, apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to their reservoirs, and by the way, it's been mostly brute force extraction methods to date, but if they do that, the IEA estimates that they will shift the yield curves on the unconventionals to match the conventionals, unlocking 5% more production. Reserves. You might say, well, what is that? Well, it's 500 billion barrels of oil equivalent. That's worth $22 trillion. What's another change that might come? How about demand erosion? We are all watching Tesla and their vehicles coming. Electrification of transportation, automated vehicles. Uh, what the motor companies are mostly concerned about is connected cars and shared cars, not electrification of transportation. That's what they're worried about. But what does that translate to a uh, hydrocarbon industry? Demand destruction, possibly, of the barrel. There are two models. We'll either see demand down by 50% or we'll see demand triple. Why tripling? Because when something gets so convenient and easy to use, like transportation services, people consume more of it. So there's a strong possibility demand could go up quite a bit. Where does that leave the rest of us? between these two extremes, supply growth on one side, demand erosion on the other. We only got two levers to pull, productivity and cost. And the early signs are very clear. We will either, we, we see very sign, uh, strong evidence that 
productivity improvements of 20 to 25 percent on our current production rates and our current use of assets, current maintenance practices are very, very achievable. And similarly, 20 percent reduction in costs. Now that comes with certain penalties, of course, certain charges, but that's the prize. Now when I talk to boards and I sketch out for them on this tablet, they go, we don't care about tablets in the field. That's not what keeps us awake at night. What keeps us awake at, at night is new business models. Those are more concerning because they, sh they crop up out of nowhere and sideswipe us. And the question they ask me is, are we at any risk? And I say, I have good news. I can only think of six ways you're going to be disrupted. But by the way, all six ways are in motion today. New business models on the horizon. I'll just walk through them quickly for you. Number one, what if we could take small company oil and gas reserves, small company oil and gas reserves, combine them in the, in the cloud, and apply crowdsourcing of geologic interpretation services to a larger pile of information, artificial intelligence, and machine learning? What could we do? Number two, what if we could deliver fuel to our vehicles directly, not have to go to convenience stores? There are 13,000 convenience stores owned by big oil companies in this country, and 17,000 if you considered Safeway and all the other places where the convenience retails. If this trend takes off, why on earth would anybody go to get fuel for their car? Just have fuel delivered to your car. Already in, already in place in some parts of the world. What if you could change the experience of driving a vehicle and you put blockchain on a car called Mobi, if you want to go look it up, BMW, Mercedes, the other European automakers, putting blockchain on vehicles. Why would you do this? Because once you have the ability to immutably register an event on blockchain, it changes and creates agency for that thing. If you're buying a Porsche sometime in the next two years, it'll come with blockchain built in. If you can put it on a car, you could put it on a frack spread. Think about that. Number four. Number four, subscription services. How might we apply the lessons of Uber to assets so that you don't have to own the asset, you rent it, you subscribe to it, you get a cycle from it, and you, bought, you purchase the cycle. You don't have to purchase the asset. How would that change how you configure a services company in Alberta that's selling a service? How would it, how would it change how an oil company purchases? These services are already here. Number five, what if we could put really, really valuable commercial data on blockchain, like carbon, carbon credits? I met with Repsol in Madrid a month ago. Very interested in this topic because the Europeans have already said the European Union will be carbon neutral by 2050. I'm sitting directly beside the Repsol digital leader, and she said to me, the one problem we haven't really got an answer for we know we're not going to get to zero in an oil company, but we're going to have to offset what we're doing in Europe with something we're going to do in Africa. And we're going to need a way to prove that we're actually doing it. And we think blockchain is the key to that. And number six, very real today. Ambient and Kelvin applied to oil fields in the United States are running the wells, the batteries, the flow lines automatically. Now, why would you do this? because you don't have to apply human intelligence to a, a, a well that's only discharging 10 barrels of oil per day. AI can do that. Six business models, all coming. So when I get asked, how is it that some have these technical successes, but so many of us experience failure? Here's what the successful ones think about. The story about digital is a story about data. It's about getting your data assets right, because data is what's driving this industry, the digital industry. Oil and gas, for the most part, we're pretty rubbish at this. Like, you've got to admit, we don't keep track of our data. We don't have clear accountability for it. It doesn't show up on our balance sheet. doesn't attract capital. We've got to get better at data. The Internet of Things, and when you go down the other side of that curtain, you're going to see a lot of really cool Internet of Things things. Those things are going to generate torrents and torrents and torrents of data headlong into a business that doesn't yet know how to deal with data. Internet of Things will generate the data. 
Excel is not the tool for processing the data. We're going to be using artificial intelligence and machine learning and IBM Watson. That's the digital tools that's going to consume all of that data and turn it into things of value. And then, like what Kelvin and Ambient are doing, robots will take that data, apply it, and do real work. And there isn't a silver answer that applies to everybody. Every business is slightly unique in terms of how you think about data, things that generate your data, the machines that interpret the data, and the potential for use of autonomy and, and robots to apply the data. Where does all of this sit? It sits on the cloud. And why is that? Because it's cheaper. It's way cheaper. Why are the big oil companies all migrating to the cloud? Because it's cheaper, way cheaper. We don't have to stand up the infrastructure to hold all of that data that's going to come from all of the Internet of Things. The cloud, you've got to get to the cloud. But how are we going to trust all of this stuff? How are you going to trust that the sensor you just saw on the other side of that curtain is trusted and the data coming off of it is trusted? That's why blockchain. That's why blockchain. It creates trust. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not a board member I've met who said, I'm okay with our current cyber protections. There are certain foundational enterprise tools that have to be in place for this to work, and it's, that's the way you find cyber, enterprise systems, things that really manage and control the data assets that we generate through all of this. Enterprise technologies are not going to go away. Now, can we do this with our current sets of behaviors in oil and gas? And I would say, no. You want to be successful at this, you've got to mimic what the digital companies do. Agile, user experience, design thinking. We need to change the way we figure out how to use these tools, and then we need to invest much more in people and change management so that we, the dawns of the world with these great ideas can find some success. Oil and gas companies are very good at avoiding failure. There's not a person in the world here, if I said show hands please or by round of applause, who here got promoted because of their last failure, right? <coughs> Doesn't happen in this industry. We have tremendous antibodies. If we could just take oil and gas as antibodies for cutting down innovation and apply it to coronavirus, the coronavirus would be gone. It would be gone. Here's some of the things that I hear all the time. I understand digital. I don't see how it applies to us. Digital is important, but it's not my priority. I got to drill wells this year. Don't worry. Digital is just another passing fad. It'll fade. These are the messages, what I call a failure of management, to communicate very clearly to the workforce how important this is. Digital is not our core business. It belongs to somebody else. We'll outsource that, get some, somebody to tackle that on our behalf. My personal favorite, remember the time we did that big ERP system? And we didn't get any value? This digital wave sure looks like it's a little bit more of that. You can just imagine these voices back in Don's home office chirping away going, no, don't do this. Another problem, the data, that's mine. I can't, I'm not sharing that, it's too much risk. That's not the digital way. Dig data wants to be free. That's why it's so easy to copy and paste. It wants to be free. And last but not least, oh, he tried that, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Let me give you some antidotes. If you hear this kind of chatter, when you finish and you see all the clever and cool things that on the other side of that curtain, you want to go back to your home office, here's the antidotes. Here's how you solve the coronavirus problem of oil and gas. Number one, honor your past, but define your future. By honoring your past, I mean, what are we really good at? What's your company really good at? If it's really good at customer service, you're going to be really good at customer service. But what's your future of customer service going to look like? If you're really good at drilling wells, continue to drill wells. But what's your future of drilling wells going to look like? This is the job of boards and managements, to find, to find the future and where we're going to take advantage of digital innovation. Number two, Don did not have this. Who is your change leader? For digital innovations to work, it's been shown that we need a 30% tipping point. You need 30% of the hearts and minds in your company to say, I'm on board. I will push through barriers to get this done. Why does Suncor have as their CEO a guy with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science? It's not an accident. It's not an accident. CEO as change leader in the digital world. 
Number three, communicate. 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 Repeat. Communicate. 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 The message has to be driven into the organization so that we get that groundswell of support, that groundswell of change. Number four, purpose-driven, focused roadmap. Show me the money. Where's the change? If I think about my friend Don, Don found a great opportunity to cut some costs in his company, but it was not on anyone's roadmap, so he didn't get the support that he needed. You have to develop that roadmap, develop that journey map of how you're going to turn value from these investments. Number five, and I really like Don's success here. He didn't, he, he was agile. He bought tablets from, I don't Best Buy, and downloaded the app for free. Like there was no cost to do this. That's the essence of agile. Fast, give it a trial. Where did it break down? He didn't have a big enough vision. His organization didn't have a big enough vision. And he ran headlong into the voices that said, don't do this. You need the big vision. Number six, put cyber security in. You can't layer it in on, on, uh, after the fact. There's not a board or management team in the world today who is going to sign up for innovation that does not have a rock solid answer on how are you going to deal with the threat of cyber activists. You, we only have to look in the paper to see how many people are opposed to the hydrocarbon industry. Got to build security in. And number seven, absolutely, stay the course. Great case example. Built the first bot to do their battery balancing. It failed. Built the second bot. Failed. Third bot. Failed. 50 iterations before they finally got the bot to do what it's supposed to do. It took work that normally took a human operator to do. Eight to ten minutes. It was being done by the bot in 45 seconds. 95% productivity improvement. Stay the course. Now, let me give you my final thinking, final five thoughts. It's not too late to get started, and the reason for that is we're just at the early stages. There's still plenty of opportunity. If you feel like it's game over, it's not. There's still lots of opportunity out there. Number one, set a north star. When Christopher Columbus was sailing to the New World, he couldn't see the New World. He knew it was going west. So he used his north star heading to guide him to the west. If you ask Rio Tinto today, what is your north star heading? for Rio's investments. Automated heavy haulers, automated underground mine, automated train hauling ore to the coast, automated ships taking the, the ore bodies to market, eventually automated ports. What is Rio doing? You might say, oh, they're destroying well-paying jobs in the mining industry. I say they're gearing up to mine asteroids. What's your vision? Set your digital north star. Next, something I'm very passionate about. You've got to educate your organization because this is not something one person does on their own. You need, it takes a village. You've got to get that 30% tipping point. Number three, build that purpose-driven roadmap. In Rio's case, the critical problem to solve in the underground mine was how do I put fuel into an underground mining vehicle? Well, one, you make it electric, but someone's still going to go down there and put a plug in it. How do you solve that problem? So they went to their network and said, that's the problem to solve. Within 18 months, the network came back and said, we have a solution, big induction pad. You just drive the equipment over the induction pad, we recharge the batteries. Don't need humans under mine, not underground. Business-driven roadmap. Number four, big challenge for oil and gas. We have to raise our data acumen. By that, I mean data science, data wranglers, understanding about data, getting our data quality as rock solid as we can, the end of big engineering diagrams and some guy out in the field with a red pen. We have to raise our data acumen. And last but not least, I mentioned this before, we've got to get our foundations in place. Cyber, enterprise technologies, um, management of our telecommunications networks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. 
If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.